coming up at 8.30 in the morning. Um, so uh, the name of the book is actually Made to Stick. Um, when I wrote the proposal for this, I was thinking ideas that stick, but these authors, Chip and Dan Heath, actually, I've read three books from them. One is called Switch, Made to Stick, and The Power of Moments. Uh, what they write about all kind of falls into the same thing. It is about how we make changes, how things get stuck in our mind. So there's a, that's kind of an overview of where they are, but I just wanted to share that because my title was incorrect. And uh, for particularly with the book Made to Stick, they situate it within uh, Malcolm Gladwell's Tipping Point, if any of you have read that particular book. Uh, and it's really a blow up of the second idea of what Gladwell talks about, but I'm not gonna get involved in that because that's outside of the realm of what we're gonna do. What I am gonna do is share my screen here and bring a PowerPoint up. Everybody see that okay? All right, I'm gonna leave it in theater mode. Okay, so I want you to complete the following. You can just shout out your answer or thumbs up or whatever. Something with rhyme. <laughs> saves nine or saves time? Saves yes. time, I think. A stitch in time saves nine. Saves nine. Yeah, the idea is if we see something that's falling apart and we stitch it before it falls apart, one stitch. It's where it's an ounce of cure or pound of pound of oh, cure or something like absolutely. that. Absolutely. It's exactly the same idea. Uh, if we take care of it before it's a problem, is worth better two than two in the bush. Yes, it's worth two in the bush. As you would, As have, you would have done unto you. Yeah. So these are ideas that uh, probably no one taught us them in class or school, but they stick. And they've been around an awfully long time. Uh, they, some go back as far as Aesop's fables. Some go back as far as like Greek mythology. They've been around for a long time. They stick. Now, let's look at it. Now, it's great. It's obviously what Nashville State does, but I, hopefully you're seeing a contrast between, here's some stuff you never learned, but you know, and it makes sense, versus something that should be informing every single decision we make every single day at our job, okay? Now, this isn't the fault of the people who wrote the mission statement or Nashville State or administrators or us. It's just a good example of how an idea gets caught up in language and words and format and can kind of miss on what we want. Does that make sense to everybody? So let's talk about what makes something sticky. It's understood and it has a lasting impact. It changes opinions or behavior, okay? Some examples. How many of you growing up heard about razor blades in apples? Yeah. Um, how many of you know it's actually completely false? How many of you heard of an urban legend about a person having a drink and then they wake up and they dial 911 and they're in a bathtub full of ice and there's a tube sticking out of their back because, yeah. Also, urban legend. <laughs> um, how many of you have heard that the Great Wall of China is the only thing visible from space? 
also not true. I mean, the wall's long, but it's, it's narrow. If you could see the Great Wall of China, you would also be able to see every highway. These are great examples of sticky ideas that changed opinions or behaviors. I mean, certainly growing up, my parents wouldn't let me eat any Halloween candy that wasn't packaged. Right? Um, they're sticky. They're simple. Okay. So sticky ideas have six principles. Um, we're going to do an overview, and then we're going to look at them in depth. Simplicity. Unexpectedness. They're concrete. They have credibility. They engage emotions. And they are involved, they're stories. So if you think about the apple thing, razor blade and an apple, Halloween candy, Halloween apples dangerous, simple idea, unexpected. Oh, we're supposed to trust people when we go to their doors and beg them to give us candy while we wear our skeleton outfits. Concrete, they're details credible. Turns out it's not, but it feels credible because think of all the things we're taught as kids, like don't trust strangers, stranger danger, all this stuff. And then Halloween breaks this rule. Oh, go see strangers and get candy. Emotion. Certainly the idea of biting into a razor blade invoked something emotional in me as a child. I could very much envision how painful and terrible, horrible that would be. And my mom, who worries more than I do, totally freaked out. Um, and it's a story, it's a tale. It's a tale we can tell, we tell generations. And these ideas propagate. It's a sticky idea, okay? So before we move on, I just wanna address this question because some of us teach different subjects and you might be thinking, well, how do I make the quadratic equation emotional? Uh, you don't need all the elements, okay? The more you can incorporate, the better chance you have. And I would argue in some cases, you can create emotion around a mathematical idea. But the important thing is to remember is the idea doesn't have to have natural talent. It doesn't have to be an urban myth like a razor blade and an apple. Um, we can engineer our ideas. And as teachers, this is what our, we want to do. And we're going to go through these things with some detail. And then we're going to look at an example together where I've taken something from a textbook and I'm gonna show you how I try to make it more sticky for my students. And then hopefully we'll have some time if we want to talk, but okay. So simple is one idea. Lawyers say that if you present 10 great ideas, when they get to the jury room, they're not gonna remember. You want one idea. And hopefully if you're, if you're a defense attorney, your one idea is, my client is innocent. Um, one idea when they walk into the room. Political strategists, if you say three things, you're saying nothing. And you don't say anything. One idea. Um, an example, this comes, goes back to when Reagan debated Jimmy Carter, for those of us who are really old and ancient. And Carter had a bunch of statistics. And Reagan said, ask yourself one question. Are you better off than you were four years ago? And that was, the, that was simple. That was memorable. And Reagan didn't just win. He really won. Um, Southwest is the low fare airline. Really simple idea. Um, when Clinton was running, he had James Carville as his political strategist. And... Uh, Carl wrote on a board, I don't know this, I believe this to be true, it's the economy, stupid, because Clinton wanted to talk a lot of, a lot of things, and he was a gifted speaker, and Carl was just like, it's the economy, stupid, to remind Clinton to stay focused. One idea. Simple is not a sound bite. It's not some clever quote that we're going to share on social media, okay? And it's not short just for the sake of being short. This is not encouraging you to take an idea and try to compress it into as few words as possible. That's not the point. What it means is it's focused and it's profound. Okay. Now the golden rule we talked about before, wherever you learned it, Immanuel Kant from Matthew 
chapter seven, I think, wherever you learned it, it's one sentence so profound, you could spend your lifetime learning it, really understanding what it means, okay? So a little detour. This is a picture of the cockpit in which my dad learned to fly. It's a Piper J3 Cub. As you can see, you have four instruments. This one has two, it has measures your fuel and I can't remember. And you have a compass, you have a control stick in the middle and there are two pedals. That's it. Now, if you were to go take a flight lesson today, this is what you'd be faced with. And this is a simple one. More complex flights actually have screens built here into the yoke. But look at all of these. There's a lot going on there. So when you think about flying, the one rule of flying is don't hit something. And if you think about it, like everything else that you do, navigation, fuel management, et cetera, is about don't smack into something that doesn't move because it'll hurt. When you're flying this, it's really easy to stay focused on it. And when you're flying this, you've got all this other stuff going on. Imagine you were going in for a flight lesson, which would be less intimidating. I think most of us, ah, I can manage this. I can, it's simple. It's just focusing on piloting the plane so you can focus on don't smack into things that don't move. Okay. Here's a picture coming up of my favorite car ever, although not the simplest I ever owned. I love this car. It was like a couch on wheels. And you can see it's just really, really simple. This is freaky because this picture I got from the internet and it's the exact same color scheme as my car. Like, but anyway, um, now my car currently is 10 years old. It's a Lexus ES350 and it's like 10 times as complicated as this. And recently I had an experience. My neighbor needed to jumpstart. And because of where their vehicle died, and there was another vehicle parked, I had to thread my car in between. And I've gotten so used to my car beeping at me when I'm near something. I trusted that a little too much. And fortunately, I glanced into a mirror just like, oh, because there wasn't a sensor where I was about to hit the car. I would never have made the mistake driving that, this vehicle. Does that make sense? Because with this, much like with flying, when we're driving, don't hit things, especially people. Those are important rules. So simplicity is important, particularly when we're thinking about sharing things with students. One thing our authors talk about is this idea of the curse of knowledge. Because if you've already understood this and you transfer to this, these are tools that are valuable to you. You can see the value, but to the beginner, it's overwhelming. That makes sense. So moving on, uh, one last piece of nostalgia from my favorite car. This car was amazing. You could drive forever, pull over, sleep in the back. It was like a, it was a house on wheels. Anyway, the next element is an idea is unexpected. Okay. So if we want to get our students' attention or we want to get anybody's attention, we want to keep it. Surprise gets our attention, interest keeps it, okay? And the most basic way to get attention is to break a pattern. If you think about our students going into our class, most of us probably have a routine and our routine is probably similar in many ways to the routine that they experienced in the previous class and the previous class, um, et cetera. But our brains are designed to notice change this is why warning lights flash. This is why sirens have evolved from a one note to a two note to multiple different patterns to get our attention. Spiders on my bathroom floor. Um, surprise, you probably didn't think we we're gonna talk about spiders, but I'm always amazed at how my 
eye can detect a spider on the floor, sometimes even like in a mostly dark environment. Because I've lived in my house now for eight or nine years, and I know my bathroom floor apparently very well, because a spider can just be hanging out and be like, surprise. Interest is keeping people's attention. So I'm gonna talk about this research of Robert Cialdini, who's a great author. Uh, he wrote a book on persuasion that I absolutely love. And what Cialdini did was he wanted to be a better teacher. He's a communications professor. And he read a bunch of um, scientific journal articles that were directed at non-scientific audiences. He wanted to find out what they had in common. And what he found out was that the most successful pieces started with a mystery story. They asked questions such as, how can we account for what is perhaps the most extraordinary feature in our solar system, the rings of Saturn? What are they made of? And how could three different groups of acclaimed scientists come to three completely different conclusions? Now, this is a great example of getting someone's interest because it, it, it creates surprise. We don't know this, people don't agree. And so what he discovered universally in the articles that appealed to him was they created this mystery, they created a question type thing. Um, okay. So our next element is concrete. If you're following along, you see this incorrectly spelled success, S-U-C-C-E-S, -C -C -E and it's missing an S. But um, concrete is something that's tangible and sensory, okay? This is not concrete, and some of these might bring a bell for us. Synergize backwards overflow. That's actually from the show 30 Rock. Uh, best practices. I'm sure we've all heard about the importance. What the hell does that mean? I don't know. Best for you might not be best for me. Metacognitive skills. Hmm. We all want to emphasize the importance of those. We know they're important. What are they? I don't know. Make sure it's developmentally appropriate. Not something we deal with so much with our students, but if you teach at, in a middle school, this is, a, this is more of a concern. Idiopathic cardiomyopathy. Of course. It literally means there's something wrong with your heart, but we don't know what it is. <laughs> it's not something you want to hear. <laughs> We've identified this as idiopathic cardiomyopathy. Um, but if we go to concrete from Martin Luther King Jr., we are tied together in an inescapable garment of destiny. What a wonderful way to say that we are all, in, we are all connected together. It's a fantastic metaphor. Sour grapes. Again, going back to Aesop's fables, instead of just saying, oh, don't be a jerk when things don't go your way, sour grapes. Instead of saying high performance, a V8 engine. Instead of saying we're customer service focused, you iron a customer shirt. This is actually a famous story from Nordstrom where a customer came in and asked to have their sh shirt ironed. And I believe the shirt wasn't even bought at Nordstrom. Um, instead of saying we're community focused, put people's name in the newspaper. We are the low fare airline. That's concrete, okay? We want our ideas to be credible. So what makes people believe ideas? Common sense. It fits with our worldview. This is, can be difficult for us as teachers. This idea of ethos, the credibility of the speaker. Our parents and friends have influenced what we believe. Our personal experiences. We, some of us see this a lot depending on what we teach. Um, one bad experience with a girlfriend or a, a significant other or whatever, and thus a judgment is made on all. And whatever faith people have can be a religious-based faith or 
a spiritually based faith, or it could be faith in science, or it could be all kinds of things. Um, moving into credibility a little more deeply, as teachers, we can generate external and internal ethos. External is easy, we have titles. We're associate professor or whatever, we have a degree from whatever. But we have internal ethos that's based on how well we do our job. Do we assess well? Are we fair and consistent? Do we treat our students well? Are we fair and consistent? Are we prepared? Do we show up on time? All kinds of things we can do as teachers to, to make us believable. Um, unfortunately, that's only part of it. Anyone who's been teaching any length of time knows that if it was that easy, our jobs would be really easy. If just being a good prepared teacher who treats people well was all it took, this job would be a piece of cake. We need ideas to have credibility, okay? We go back to those urban legends we talked about at the beginning. One of the reasons that the Halloween apples story sticks is there are details that feel real. Now, if you stopped and thought about it, putting a razor blade inside an apple would clearly leave a mark on the apple. That should be evident. But our brains can skip that because the rest of it made sense. We can place it. We can. So those details make an idea credible. And they need to be concrete and tangible. When we deal with abstract, I mean, this is almost a, by definition, it's almost a, uh, uh, I've lost the word I'm looking for, but we want those details to be vivid. Too often, I think, particularly our textbooks, don't, and that's our job is to make them vivid. So a good example is what's called the human scale principle. So I'm gonna show something on the screen for you to read. I want you to compare it with So this, these two statements came from a study that was done. This statement was judged to be 58% uh, by 58% of people to be credible. This statement was judged to be 83 by 83% of the audience to be credible. The math is exactly the same. The ratios are the same. But the second one is judged to be more credible because human scale. Two thirds of an inch, I understand much better than one third of a mile. Miles 5,280 feet. So a third of that is what, 1,700, you know, 760 feet, you know, whatever. I don't, okay. Um, throwing something from the sun to the earth, I, I can only imagine. I can really only imagine throwing something from New York to Los Angeles, but you can see how this human scale thing matters. 58% um, versus 83%, same exact information. So next we wanna talk about things being emotional. And this again, as I said at the beginning, for some subjects, it might be harder to make things feel emotional. Um, but some things we can learn, Mother Teresa, if I look at the mass, I will never act. If I look at the one, I will. And this is a good example. Um, it's really easy for us not to donate when we hear about all the, you know, starving animals or abused animals. But if you go to the humane center and you look at the animals, it's, it's really hard not to want to come home with one or to come home with one or more. Um, John Cables is one of the greatest copywriters of all time. Talks about companies often emphasize features when they should talk about benefits. Benefits are emotional, features are not. So for example, 
You can laugh at money worries if you follow this simple plan. The secret of how to be taller. Retire at 55. These are, and you might obviously recognize these as clickbait, but I'll admit that sometimes clickbait works. I'd like to retire at 55. Let's come in right up. 10 facts about diarrhea. Number two will surprise you. That's just a joke. Unexpected. All right. <laughs> and lastly, we're going to talk about stories. So, uh, as I mentioned before with Robert Cialdini and his research, the reason those pieces that started with questions that presented a mystery work and engage us and keep our interest is because they have the structure of narrative and human beings respond to narrative, okay? We're hardwired. And if you think about this from an evolutionary perspective, knowledge was transmitted through story. Telling a kid, don't go out there, don't eat candy, that someone is, is enwrapped, whatever. In the moment, a kid, especially a kid like me, I'm like, I'm gonna eat that. But if you tell me a story about how there may be a razor blade involved in it, I'm, I'm listening, okay? Stories create mental stimulation, which isn't as good as actually learning the hard way or doing something, but it puts it in like a flight simulator situation, okay? Um, stories can be broken down quite simply. Um, you establish, uh, you can look at it as a, you know, I'm not gonna go into it. There are books, uh, you can read about it, but what makes a story is actually pretty simple. We just need to care about something. Um, in some way, shape or form, something has to happen that makes us care. And those of us who finished bad books and bad movies and so forth, just to see what happened to this idea. Yeah, it works. Um, I think even more exciting to me, at least from a, a, a teaching perspective, is when I have to finish a story when I already know what's gonna happen. I just finished Dexter, those of you who heard the news, the final season of Dexter, and I knew from the first episode what was gonna happen, but I still stuck it out and watched all 10 episodes to see it happen. Uh, so story frameworks are really easy to learn. You, you just create a situation and you throw a hook and people will follow the hook. I'm assuming you built it correctly. There's some art to it, of course. But so we think about stories and teaching. Just got a couple examples here of situations that where we can see how a story creates something that teaches students what we want them to learn. So in math, I used to be a math teacher, and it's kind of easy to show someone how to solve equations, even though it might look complicated but it's really hard to teach students how to solve word problems because they have to recognize the equation. And if you teach math, one thing you're gonna realize is teaching the equation is actually kind of the easy part. Applying it is the hard part. Same thing in anything medically related or well, anything you're doing the diagnosis. Um, if, uh, if someone comes in with appendicitis, um, you remove it, the end which is a relatively simple procedure, but creating the diagnosis that someone has appendicitis and not something else, that's a, that's a story. That's a conceptualization of things. This is where my doctors have residencies and so forth, because they need to tr learn those stories. Um, in history, uh, I mean, we can ask students to memorize dates and places, but we're not really teaching them history. Okay, we're not teaching them the story. As a writer of a speech or a paper, I mean, I can present a formula. I can have a textbook here, the Norton Field Guide to Writing, and my students can look up some ways to create an introduction. But it's never going to be as effective as teaching them how an introduction works in the form of a narrative. Um, in communication, we talk about psychological noise. And my students try to you know, take notes and memorize a definition, but 
I tell them from day one, the best way to ace this class is to do it, not memorize it, because I'm much more interested in you knowing what it means. I'm not going to hang you up on not knowing the name. Um, so I know we've got a lot going on in the chat and I can't see it. Is there anything there I need to respond to? Is there anything like a quick? No? Okay. So what I like to do with you now, I feel like I'm talking really fast, um, is I'm going to show you an excerpt from our intro to, uh, excuse me, our Fundamentals of Communication textbook. And we're going to sort of analyze it through this lens. And then I want to show you how I approach it with my students. Okay, so. Okay, I'm hoping everyone had a chance to read that. It's hard for me to judge because I've read it so many times. Um, so there are some things about this I don't like from a structural perspective, from a grammatical perspective. Oh, I shouldn't say grammatical, I should say more that it's more structural, but um, but if we look at it, message meanings are in people. That is indeed simple. And it is profound if you truly understand the concept. In fact, I would say that this is the foundation of the study. Um, is it unexpected? Not at this point in the textbook. This actually shows up in chapter four, when I actually think it ought to be in chapter one, but I didn't write the textbook. Um, and at this point, our students have seen this format on this page hundred times more. Um, there's nothing in the language that's particularly untextbooky or different or unique. Um, it sounds like academic ease watered down for freshmen to discover the meaning a person is trying to communicate. It's necessary to look into the person as well as the words. Blah, 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 blah. It sounds like typical textbook. Is it concrete? Well, there's an attempt to be concrete here for sure. They're using the example of the word cancer and the example of I love you, okay? Is it credible? Uh, I think a reasonable student would recognize that cancer means something different to an oncologist versus uh, a mother whose child. I think that that's an attempt at being concrete. Is it emotional? Probably not unless you can specifically relate to these things, probably not. And is it a story? Not really. Now, hello. Uh, so it is a key idea. Let me present this to you differently. Oh, that's all right. We can stay right there. Um, What this is stating is that when we say something, the people receiving it are going to interpret it in their way, which is not necessarily the way we intended. And it's also saying when we hear something, we're hearing it in our way, which is not necessarily the way the person intended. Now, the key core to a, a communication class is for students to recognize this and learn some strategies to reduce the variance between the message that is encoded and the message that's decoded, both as an encoder, as a speaker and a listener. Okay, so it's a key idea. It is the foundation of the course. And like I mentioned, it kind of shows up. It shows up in chapter four, verbal messages, and I really think it ought to be in chapter one. Um, 
but that's another story. But as a teacher, I had this really key idea. And I also have evidence from exams and student work that it's not a concept students learn well. Um, they, they don't test well, they don't, it, assessments don't demonstrate that this is the, as, as important to them as it should be. Okay, so what I do is I share a video with my students and I'm gonna share it with you. And this is from the show Modern Family if you don't recognize it. And we're gonna actually watch it twice so I don't think you have to catch it all, but it's just. We'll start now. Well, we're done. One more session this week, and Manny will be ready for his test. Ay, qué bueno. Mm, que estás cocinando huele increíble. Gracias. Esos tomates son de su jardín. Ay, no, ya yo quisiera, pero las ardillas se comen todo lo que yo planto ahí. Te dan ganas de dispararles desde aquí y matarlas. <laughs> Una vez traté la jardinería, fue demasiado duro mi espalda. En un par de horas, Estaba caminando como un viejito. <laughs> what did I say? If I knew, he would be. So, if you're not familiar with the show, this character, Jay, is married to the Sophia Vergara, the attractive thing. And this gentleman here has been hired as a Spanish tutor. So, Previous and before this scene, and I would share this with my student, of course, it's set up that Jay is feeling some insecurity. It's actually a running theme in the show. He's this older, out of shape guy married to this young, attractive woman. And he's kind of constantly feeling some insecurity that she loves him for his money and not for him as a person and yada, yada, yada. And in this particular episode, there's this joke about he's building a cop, uh, model of the USS Constitution and what a nerd he is and what an old fart and blah, blah, blah. So when he sees this communication, he of course doesn't speak Spanish. So he's seeing it non-verbally. And there are a whole bunch of concepts that we teach that are relevant, but it's a great example of how two people are having a conversation that's completely innocent and someone else is seeing it and they're seeing a completely different conversation. And I'm gonna, Stop it at a couple points to emphasize a few points that in case. And it worked. Well, we're done. One more session this week, and Manny will be ready for his test. Ay, que bueno. Mm, lo que estás cocinando, Willie. So, if you notice what his hands were doing, um, you can figure that out on your own. And we can see the reaction to what his hands are doing and the tone. Obviously, he doesn't understand the words, but he probably understands incredible. And moving on. And now she's pointing her fake gun at her husband while talking to the young, attractive man. Now, this is a story. This is a story we all know. Younger woman marries older guy. Another young guy shows up. We get rid of the husband. I mean, this is the story as old as time. Um, and we hear the, the vocal change, the paralanguage. So, this is a great example. I share this with my students. Is it simple? Absolutely. Anyone can understand it. Is it unexpected? Yeah, most students don't expect to show up and watch Modern Family and uh, slightly off color jokes. Is it concrete? Yes. Is it credible? At this point, it becomes credible because if the student isn't immediately recognizing it, the activity we do to follow, I simply ask them to write on a time when they misunderstood what someone said or they were misunderstood, which is the one that most of them latch onto. Um, someone saw something they did or heard something they said and misinterpreted. Uh, most teenagers, this is their life. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
So it makes it concrete. Is it emotional? Well, yeah, we can laugh at it, but we can also relate to it in a funny way, but in many cases, in a painful way. Um, when we were misunderstood or our words were twisted into something we didn't mean. Um, and does it fit into a story? If I do it right, they create their own stories and they share them with their classmates. And there is this incredible like building of story that happens when we have a discussion based on this, because even the students who might not quite get it the first round, when they hear their classmates share about a time something happened to them when they said something to a parent or a significant other or a best friend overheard something that they said or a text message was misinterpreted, it starts to build for them like, oh, we create our own meaning. And it's a way to kind of follow this simple, unexpected, concrete, credible, emotionally driven story that makes it stick. Every semester I do this earlier, and this semester I'm going to do it probably not on day one, but definitely day two or three, even though it's out of sequence with a textbook, because I really wanna reference this concept the rest of the semester. It's the underpinning of the class. Why is it important that your speech introduction is written well? Because it makes sense to you in your head, but it doesn't necessarily hook and get your audience. Um, that's really all I have, but I'd love to share, uh, try to answer any questions or hear from people or what, whatever. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen actually. Take a look at the chat. <laughs> the 80s satanic panic um, back when they were playing stairway to heaven backwards and uh, Ozzy Osbourne was testifying in front of the Senate because of his song Suicide Solution and so forth. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Janessa, there is a recording that you uh, will be able to look at. If you don't have any questions or comments, I'm completely happy. I'll just assume that you were blown away, your mind is full, and you're processing. Harlan, to build on what you're saying, I know Brene Brown's research goes into this a lot, but the story I'm telling myself is is a great way of helping to deal with conflict because so many times when we're interpreting meaning, the story we're telling ourselves and the story the other person is telling themselves may be completely different stories. And being able to take that step back to look at it from a story perspective instead of, oh, that person is a great way of looking at it. And I've done that with my students sometimes as they've walked in and they said, oh, this professor hates me. I'm like, oh, what's the story you're telling yourself? Yeah. How are you acting in their class so that we can really look at how we're interpreting meaning there? Because very, very rarely, I think as professors, we hate students. And so being able to talk about that story really helps to find actual meaning there. And thank you to Robert for dropping into the chat our form for feedback. If you'll please take a moment to take that survey. And we have workshops all throughout the day today and tomorrow for you. And we hope that you will be able to join us. Other comments and questions? Um, I would just like to add that um, this is something I've struggled with for a long time. And I think it's that curse of knowledge you were talking about. I have so much information and so many things I wanna share and that are so important that you understand because you're gonna, if you're gonna be a teacher, you got to know all this stuff. And I can't wait to tell you what you need to know and, you know, get you involved in, in learning it for yourself. And I got to step back and focus on just fewer points. <laughs> I want to cover way too much. And I'll be more effective if I can just cover fewer that stick. Yeah. When I used to, I used to teach high school, and uh, actually, that's why I started as a math teacher at a high school, but I ended up teaching English. And one of my colleagues who I worked with extensively and 
you know, it was a wonderful experience. At, but he would say like, he taught his class very differently than I did. And I was very active and engaged. And, and he's like, I'd rather have them remember 100% of what they figure out on their own than 20% of what I tell them. And, you know, we used to kid with Paul, like, wow, you're the laziest teacher here. Because he, he, you know, he was very much on top of like think pair share activities and things like that. But uh, he was absolutely right. And over time observing his class and having these conversations, I began to realize like, it's like I said, with the flying example, rule number one, don't hit something. Um, when I learned to drive, I learned in a manual transmission pickup truck. And the first thing my dad made me do is be able to go up and down the driveway, which was like a 10 degree incline. And yeah, he's like, it's kind of pointless to go out on the street if you can't do step one. <clears throat> Harlan, I'm, I'm just curious. You said you've uh, already done this particular exercise in your classes, right? Yes. yes. How did that go over with students? Uh, I don't, not quite this, but I do. I use uh, Christine Headley's uh, TED Talk on listening, how to listen. And, yeah. And, uh, I do a whole paper, like sort of just focused around this idea of how do you actually listen? Yeah. Uh, so I'm just curious, like what what your student reactions were to that. Um, really. So they, I mean, they, they love the video. And throughout the semester, I, I mean, I use episodes of The Office sometimes, or My Name is Earl. So we build this, um, and they do, I will say first, I start with something short like this because it teaches them that this isn't just, oh, we're watching TV. It's kind of like the notes thing we talked about yesterday. My students will just stop taking notes, but it goes well. I use uh, the uh, Celeste Headley's 10 Ways to Have a Conversation with my students, both as an example of how to effectively present, but also how to listen because she does a great job of doing all of these particular things. She keeps it simple, simple. She gives them, you know, she makes it emotional and so forth. So my experience um, has, is that students really do well with this. Uh, I'm giving you a longer winded answer than you, the question you asked, but um, we separate fundamentals of communication into chapters one through five and then six through 10. So at the end of chapter five, we will watch an episode of usually The Office and we use it as a review. So we talk about non, excuse me, nonverbal communication, verbal communication or messages, um, listening, the perception, um, the self and the communication model. And we use that as a review technique and overwhelmingly the feedback I get from my students is like, this is the best thing we did this semester. So. Well, I still get that the snow day was the best day. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, after snow day, we liked watching TV. So you know, keep it simple. Know your audience. Um, well, I uh, Amy has dropped that if, uh, link into the uh, chat if you're not familiar with it. Um, funny story about how students respond to things. I showed this once and I said, so what did you think? Which is a terrible question to ask as a teacher because you're gonna get an honest answer. And someone said, she needs a personal stylist. So <laughs> sometimes we miss. Um, but anyway, I appreciate y'all showing up at 8.30 this morning and listening to me. And uh, I hope you gained something. Again, the authors are Chip and Dan Heath made to stick. They also have a book called Switch. And they also have a book called The Power of Moments. Uh, they're all excellent books with a, a lot of really good ideas. I can't remember, I believe it's Chip Heath who actually teaches at Stanford and uh, is focused on education. So there are a lot of ideas in these books that we can think about as, as educators. Thank you, Harlan, for being up, awake, coherent at 8.30 to share amazing expertise with us this morning. Everyone, have a beautiful and wonderful rest of the day. We'll see you at PD as the day goes on. Thank you for being here. Thanks.